Hello, and thank you for joining this OncLive peer exchange titled Acute Lymphocytic Leukemia, Practical Perspectives. Significant advances have been made in improving outcomes for patients with acute lymphoblastic leukemia, particularly with the availability of novel therapies such as blinatumumab, inatuzumab, ozogamycin, and newer BCR-ABL tyrosine kinase inhibitors. More recently, we have seen the game-changing FDA approval of the first CAR-T therapy for younger patients with relapse disease. However, for older patients with ALL, survival is still poor and there is a need for less intensive but effective treatment strategies. In this OncLive peer exchange discussion, I am joined by a panel of experts in treating adult patients with ALL. Together, we will discuss practical strategies for treatment and how to incorporate novel therapies into clinical practice. I'm Dr. Mark Litzo, and I'm a professor of medicine and chair of the, of the Leukemia Committee of ECOG Akron and head of the Acute Leukemia Group at the Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota. Participating today on our distinguished panel are Dr. Ryan Cassidy, assistant professor in the Division of Hematology at the University of Washington School of Medicine in Seattle, Washington. Dr. Aaron Logan, Assistant Professor of Hematology and Bone Marrow Transplant at the University of California, San Francisco, in San Francisco, California. Dr. Bijal Shaw, Assistant Member, Department of Malignant Hematology at the Moffitt Cancer Center in Tampa, Florida. And Dr. Anthony Stein, Clinical Professor at the Gear Family Center for Leukemia Research, City of Hope in Duarte, California. Thank you so much for joining us. Let's begin. Our first segment is on induction therapy for adult acute lymphoblastic leukemia. Before we talk about therapy, we need to talk about the initial assessment of patients uh, when they're first diagnosed and how we classify and prognosticate about the patients. Ryan, can I ask you to elaborate on, on some of these uh, uh, features of how we assess patients at diagnosis? Uh, sure, Mark. So um, there's certainly a lot of heterogeneity, heterogeneity and complexity uh, when, when uh, managing adults with ALL. Um, age is a, is a commonly used uh, criteria that we use. Um, there's, at least in my practice and I think many others, we sort of uh, define uh, young adults with ALL uh, depending on the specific study used. Uh, uh, it may vary a bit, but generally speaking, if you're talking about someone at the age of 40, uh, that would be considered a young adult. When you start to get over the age of 60 or so, then you start to talk about elderly patients. Uh, and the way that we manage that across the spectrum can really vary uh, depending on goals of therapy, ability to tolerate certain regimens, and so forth. Along with that comes changes in the biology of the disease. Generally speaking, older patients are more likely to have adverse biologic factors in their disease, whether it's cytogenetic abnormalities or the like. Um, other risk classification systems that we use, historically high white blood cell count uh, is something that has sort of stood the test of time as, a, as, a, as an adverse prognostic factor. Um, so as, as we've established a little bit more understanding about the biology of the disease, those cytogenetic abnormalities like uh, MLL rearrangements, uh, complex karyotype, uh, the Philadelphia chromosome, uh, presence or absence. Uh, these are the things that we look at a lot in terms of understanding sort of those baseline characteristics that can help us understand how to treat patients. Joel, how, what's your uh, perspective on this? And in particular, could you comment about uh, some of the molecular assessment and this newer category of pH-like uh, ALL? Absolutely. I, I think what we're seeing more and more, particularly in our young adult population, is a high frequency of pH-like abnormalities, which we define as rearrangements of CRLF2 and JAK2 predominantly. There are other rearrangements, rearrangements, rearrangements involving PDGFR and other kinase uh, pathways, but really CRLF2 and JAK2 stand out, and they're going to account for the overwhelming majority of the pH-like patients that we'll see. I do think it's important to identify these patients up front. I think these patients are more likely to have MRD at the end of therapy, are more likely to fail therapy. And so understanding that dynamic gives us the opportunity to start thinking from day one, how are we best going to optimize our sequence of therapies if, if indeed we need to sequence multiple therapies to achieve the best outcome for these patients. 